Hello class, today we're going to be going over how to make a little bit of cutlery. We're going to start you off with how to make a two-pronged fork. Now this is a little bit small to be used as a barbecue fork, which is probably what you are more used to seeing two-pronged forks being used as, but this can be used as just a normal fork if you're uh, going camping or something. It'd be nice to have something a little bit more rustic than your average uh, set of silverware. And then when you're finished with that, we are also going to have you guys making your own spoons. These ones are a little bit easier than the forks. They work off of a lot of the same principles as the first couple steps of the bottle opener. You're going to be getting to use some ball peen hammers today as well as our dishing stump to make the spoons. So let's get into it. So we're going to begin by sectioning off a one inch section at the end of a piece of one inch by one quarter inch rectangular bar. As you can see here, I'm basically going to be shouldering this similar to how we would shoulder a leaf. Although I am using both sides of the anvil here and just carefully hammering with the corner of my hammer. And you're going to continue shouldering until you get something that looks a bit like that. Try to leave the head of the fork pretty much untouched. Then we're going to spin it around and hammer it from the other side. Now, if you wanted to, once you have this stem tapered out, you could just leave the end square. I think that looks like a pretty nice fork. I decided to try to taper the end of this fork and spoon combo. Just a personal preference, though. So as you can see, I'm drawing mine to a point, working on the stem a little bit, trying to get both sides even. And once I have those pretty even, we're going to go on to separating the tines. And for that, you're going to need a chisel. So here I have my chisel, and I'm going to try to get it dead center in the middle of the head. And I'm going to cut from the end to the very tip. Now notice every time I hit with the chisel, I am letting it bounce out and then I am re-establishing. You only want to hit once every time you establish your chisel. Now this is a little hard to see through the camera, but it, if you remember the circle that you would get on the opposite side of the material when you were punching your holes, you'll get something similar to that in a line uh, when you're chiseling from the opposite side. So try to make it line up. You can see at the tip there I didn't get these perfectly lined up, but it's not going to end up making a difference. Now this isn't mandatory, but instead of finishing the cut using the chisel, I'm going to turn it upside down and use a hardy cut tool. And you'll see that the tail there was pretty cold. That's because I quenched that so that when I hammered from the opposite end, I didn't deform the tail. Now you're going to take it over to the corner of the anvil, and you're going to hammer one of those tines 90 degrees to the rest of it, so that you have enough space to come over to the near side of the anvil and start hammering those tines out to a point. And from this point, it is largely going to be the same as just drawing out points like we were doing for the S-hooks and the J-hooks. You're going to hang it over, make sure that, just like with a leaf, the tine that you're not working on is hanging off the anvil so that there's no risk of you accidentally hitting it. You're going to draw this out till it's a square point, and then... I decided that I was going to round mine out. You don't necessarily have to round yours out. I think it'll look a little bit nicer just because if you leave it square, it'll be very apparent if it's twisted by accident. And you'll see here I'm kind of having to turn it and hammer it at an angle. I can't hammer it straight on and off, otherwise the other tine will get in the way. But like I said, we're going to round this out. And I didn't actually measure how long uh, this first one was. I just planned on making the second one to match and uh, this happened to be almost exactly two and a half inches long. So when you're done with that and you're ready to go over to the other tine, you're going to set it upright on the anvil, hammer the opposite tine down, 
And now you can work on the one that you left for a second. And unsurprisingly, you're going to do the second time exactly the same as you did the first time. Just try to pay attention to how long you're making it. Try to make them match as best you can. If they're not perfect, that's fine. You can fix it later with a file. So once you have them both drawn out, you're just going to go over to the horn of the anvil. Make sure that you flattened them out first, of course. And you're going to bend them over. The reason we're doing this over the horn of the anvil is so that there's a little bit of a gap between them. And I'm just going to go through here with some scrolling tongs just to nicen them up a little bit. The only thing left to do is you're going to bend them slightly over the horn of the anvil and then bend them out the other way at a larger radius so that you get this nice little swoop. I'm going to use both sides of the uh, horn here just to make sure that they're even. And there you have your fork. Now let's move on to the spoon. Now the spoon is going to start out exactly the same as a bottle opener. You're going to knock down these corners so that you don't have to worry about doing it later. If you left this until later, you would either end up with a square spoon or if you had already established a neck, the head would most likely just roll around and probably snap off. And now from here, what you're going to do is exactly the same as your fork. You're going to shoulder it. Uh, because I've already shown you that today, I'm going to take a little bit of a shortcut and use this fullering jig. I've separated off another one inch section from the tip. And what you do with the fullering jig is you just wedge it in there, make sure it's lined up, and you hammer down. Preferably you would turn it uh, halfway through. I got a little bit overzealous, and you'll see why that's an issue here in a second. Um, again, I would prefer it if you actually shouldered it by hand. I'm just doing this to save some time for the video. And you'll see that's a little bit crooked. That's because I forgot to turn it around while I was doing it. But from this point, we're going to make the handle exactly the same as we did with the fork, hanging the head of the spoon off the anvil and hammering in these steep shoulders. And like I said with the fork, if you wanted to leave the end square, I actually think that looks a little bit nicer. Maybe round off the corners. Um, you don't have to waste time on tapering it quite as much as I did. All right, now that I have this point, I'm going to turn it back around so that we can continue working on the head. As you'll see, I've switched to a ball peen hammer here, and I'm using almost exclusively the peen of the hammer from this point out. The reason we're using the peen of the ball peen is because it does a really good job of moving a lot of material very quickly, and unlike the cross peen, the ball peen will actually move the material in all directions. And you can see that the edge is getting a little bit frayed because when you hit with the ball peen near the corner, you're going to move a lot of material and that's going to cause it to look a little bit flaky. And I'll show you how we fix that in a second here. Right now I'm going in with the head and I'm going to nicen that up a little bit, but we're not done uh, flattening this out. We want this to be very thin and very wide. you can see how effective it is at moving material here especially. Once you have that nice and thin, you're going to go around and tidy up the corner. And the way you do that is, as you can see here, you just go around and very meticulously and very carefully 
anywhere where it doesn't look like it's sticking out quite enough you'll hammer that down and it should push it out so that you get a nice clean looking perimeter Once you have it flattened and with a nice perimeter, we're going to go over to the dishing stump, which is just a piece of wood, and you're going to hammer down again using the peen of the hammer. Now, as you hammer, the wood will burn a little bit of a divot, which allows you to get these lips curling up like this. You're going to want to keep rotating the spoon, hammering from all directions so that it doesn't curl up only in one dimension. You want it to dish, not curl. And once you have it mostly dished, you can tidy it up a little bit by very, very gently going over and hammering it on the edge on the uh, face of the anvil. You want to be very, very delicate at this point because you run the risk of folding it over, which is something that you probably won't be able to recover from. So be gentle, take your time, and uh, keep at it until you get a dish that you think is satisfactory. After that, I'm going to make sure that it's flat. It'll sometimes curl up while you're dishing it. And then I'm just going to add a little bit of a curve to the handle. And once you get to this point, you are pretty much done. All you have to do after that is go to the wire brush with both of these, give it some beeswax, and you have a fork and spoon.